physical, mechanical work right. to do. And I think it's interesting to look at that too. Yeah. Because it explains, I think, a little bit of why, beyond just the passion of being involved in this effort and believing in these kinds of principles in feminism, there was just a lot of work to do. There oh, was yes. just a lot of physical work. Yeah. You know, that I think it's well, important. There was a lot of letter writing. There were visitations that were done at legislators' home offices. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting because uh, New Jersey has a year-round legislature. <laughs> Virginia doesn't. And so you have to catch them when you can in Richmond, or you have to catch them when they're back at home or whatever. So there were visitations to their offices. It was going to Richmond to try to catch them in the hallway or something, uh, you know, when they're going in between sessions or something like that. So, so that was a sort of a log logistical issues that had to be addressed in terms of doing it. Um, but the other part of this was that because of this whole ERA focus, there was a lot of focus on um, electing people in Virginia who would be supportive of the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. And so I remember working on Chuck Robb's first gubernatorial campaign. And when he won that year, and it was a uh, it was a sweep for the Democrats. We were all thrilled because we actually thought that that would make a huge difference, having him, you know, in the um, in the le as the governor and so on. Um, and there was a local woman um, who had been on the board of supervisors in Roanoke County for many many years, mm -hmm. and she was a woman, I guess. She would have been, I'm trying to think now how old May would have been, but um, she was my mother's age. She actually was my mother's college roommate, and that's how I knew her. But um, anyway, she decided to run um, in Virginia, and so there was a whole group of us from the NOW chapter that worked for her campaign because, again, it was a woman's voice going to be in the somewhere in the legislature, and that that was going to make a difference for us. So it was not just only focused on ERA, well it was, but it was all the other outlying things. So it was the lobbying, it was working in campaigns, it was setting up phone banks. Um, there was a wonderful woman um, by the name of Leela Spitz who was uh, worked at Ro Roanoke College, mm -hmm. and she was masterful. Um, she had been a very active in the Democratic Party for years. She was just a wonderful person who worked on uh, setting up phone banks, creating lists. Now again, in this day and age, thinking about the kind of stuff that's now being done over the internet, this was really primitive by comparison. But we had incredible data. Mm -hmm. uh, that she was really able to teach us how to do this and so forth. So, you know, my first campaign that I ever worked in was in Virginia. And of course, being back, since I've been back in Virginia, I mean, New Jersey, I've done a lot of work in a variety of campaigns mm -hmm. uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I owe a lot to, to Leela. Yeah, a good mentor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these days you just, you know, you buy somebody's email list. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean that's one of the ways that you shortcut that right. that process. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that a few years ago, buying people's email lists and what that meant. Um, in the one of the things that very few people know about, because histories of the women's movement tends to kind of walk up to where the ERA does not get ratified. Mm -hmm. um, most of those histories do not go into the fact that in a few states it was a few people yes. um, ultimately who killed it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, by some counts it was a matter of just eight mm -hmm. people in the country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's really <laughs> narrow. Um, and then histories tend to take a turn to it's the Reagan era a kind of backlash begins, sort of third wave feminism begins to get its engine moving, and the, 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 the histories turn to the cultural effects of feminism. Um, and 
and move away from the politics of the women's movement because the story of the ERA doesn't end happily, you know. Um, but because of that, we don't get to hear about the end of that story. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to put that, if you, would, if you want to talk about it, I don't want to put that at the end of the, of the discussion because yeah. that's right. a really, it's just really profoundly sad. Um, but I think some of the details of that experience, of that time, um, how people were, how people in the movement were responding, how people outside the movement were responding, um, is important to know because we don't get to see it. Mm -hmm. We don't get to know that part. Well, I'm sure you've probably, through some of the other people that you've talked to, um, have heard about what happened um, essentially in the Virginia um, legislature on the fight for the final vote. Yes, but that story is not yet on film. Okay. <laughs> so it, this would be a good time okay. to tell. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, maybe some of these folks will remember some of the details better than I, but what I recall was being in Richmond for the final vote. And we had all, uh, all the folks who were uh, ERA supporters had been gathered in a room to sort of talk about, um, you know, what the vote count was. And there were very, um, you know, I don't know what I want to say, very well organized people who had done some vote count counting. And we knew that it was going to be very, very close, but we actually thought that we might win by one vote. Wow. And um, I remember um, essentially, um, because I guess there were so many people that were there that day for this, I don't remember actually being in the, um, in the room in the Capitol where the General Assembly was voting mm -hmm. or whatever, but I remember sort of being in the hallways and outside and so on. And I remember someone coming in to a group and telling us what the outcome was. And there was a woman, and I just cannot remember her name, but she was a wonderful person uh, who lived in the Blacksburg, Virginia area. Mm -hmm. And she had worked so hard on her local um, General Assembly representative. And, you know, she thought of him as a friend, and he, you know, swore to her that he was going to vote yes and so on. Well, he voted no. Oh my God. Um, and I remember her finding this out. And I didn't know the guy. I mean, I knew his name, but I'd never met the man. But she was devastated. And I, we were all devastated. Mm -hmm. And she was sobbing. And, you know, I mean, our tears were rolling down my face, too, at the, betray the sense of betrayal that someone tells you that they're going to do something and then they either vote against you or I think in one case or two, maybe, I forget now whether it was one or two people who literally walked, which meant they didn't vote. So as a consequence, um, the ERA did not pass. And I just remember this overwhelming sense of just sorrow and, um, I mean, if it's possible, it's worse than somebody dying. I mean, you feel like all of these years of effort and um, the, the resources, the people power, the money, everything that went in to working on this, just in the state of Virginia, never mind all of the other states that, where this yeah. happened, yeah. The, it just was so sad and very, very distressing. That's all I can say. I mean, we were just, we were all a mess. And I think I felt, personally, I just felt emotionally exhausted. And after that, um, was when, after that vote, because I had, my husband had moved back to New Jersey to take a new job, and I had decided to stay in Virginia for the last, those last three months um, until the legislature voted. And I remember, I, we were, I was living in the home of um, some friends of ours who gave me their, their you know, second floor be bedroom. I put a phone in there, and that's where I was able to do my organizing, and I paid for the phone bill. But um, I remember coming back to New Jersey and just sort of not feeling like doing anything much for a little while. And I know that the deadline came in June, and. There was a whole group of women from southern New Jersey who were part of the 
the then um, South Jersey now Alice Paul chapter that went down for that final the all of the activities uh, the demonstration that was happening around the deadline day and I can remember us standing on the street and just sobbing mm -hmm. over all this so it was a very sad time yeah and it's very hard to come back from something like that I mean it took years I think for for some people to mm -hmm. not you know you feel like you've had a huge personal loss, never mind, you know, the, the, com the communal loss. Yeah, the social, yeah. the social consequences, right, right. right? Yeah, and it's amazing, I think, it's amazing to me that so many of the women who were involved did bounce back eventually. Yeah, oh, And yes. did, you know, get back into the fray, as it were. Right. Um, but it's, you know, it's interesting, you said it's worse, almost worse than death, because mm -hmm. death, is, it just happens. But these are choices. Yes. You know, these are deliberate. Right. This is somebody telling you, right. you're not welcome in the club. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you're not, you know. Um, and that's And what, that's and, and for something that one would think seems so simple and obvious, Meaning, you know, we keep talking about all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, long since have we um, realized that men just doesn't mean males. It means men and women in that context. But, of course, let's go back to the literal, <laughs> the literal, <laughs> the literal interpretation. interpretation. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And so, um, so yes, it, it's... That's why I feel as though, from 1982 to the present, it's taken that length of time for people to really sort of think through all this, and frankly, for the public consciousness to, I think, recognize that it's long since passed mm -hmm. when women should be given equal rights through the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And people who actually think that it's in there. And, you know, all of those poll numbers and everything. So I feel like, um, you know, maybe it was not time yet, but I sure hope it's time before I die. Let's put it that yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> Would that just be the best? <laughs> because, I, because I think yeah. about all of these generations of women starting in 1923, when the ERA was first introduced into Congress by Susan B. Anthony's nephew uh, and others, um, to the present, think about how many generations of women have been working on this, women and men, and, and then generations before, right? And, 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 and yes, yeah, well, and, and the women and the women who came before them, who got us to the point of at least having the right to vote. Thank you very much in 1920. Yeah, that's a good time. But the job isn't finished. <laughs> right. And until such time as we can get, I guess, uh, what would be called a critical mass mm -hmm. um, awareness of this, both in the public, but also within Congress. Um, yeah, I don't know. A sense of urgency and desire yeah. around it, you know. It's, a, it's one of the conversations I wind up having sometimes with my friends who just kind of think this is a moot point. <laughs> you yeah. know, a lot of people do. Or that the ERA was ratified, yes. you know, because there wasn't a huge amount of noise for a long time mm -hmm. in the public media about that loss. Right. Um, and a lot of people stopped paying attention. They were just sure it was going to pass. I mean, obviously, duh. Mm -hmm. um, but they argue sometimes, you know, my friends will say, well, why do we need it now? You know, we have these other provisions and these other laws that, you know, give us essentially, you know, those protections. And I say, well, none of those are anchored in an amendment. Those right. are not part of the Constitution. Right. Those are just regular laws. Yes. And if the political and we see how those regular laws can, be, can changed. be changed and yes. they can be undone, you know, right. um, there's a reason that you know the Republicans have voted fifty times or something now to repeal yes. the Affordable Care Act is because any law can be repealed, including right. the one that lets you have your own checking account. Right. So exactly. you know somebody gets real mean about it. So you know there's there's an it, there's a there's a real insecurity mm -hmm. um, that. People don't, women often don't feel because they don't know it exists, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's kind of interesting to watch their faces when they go, you mean that could change? I'm like, oh, no. I mean, women have only had their own lines of credit since 1960-something. Yeah, something. Exactly. <laughs> you know, people didn't think we could be moral agents for a millennia. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's a real... Um, uh, an urgency that I think people are kind of insulated from, you know, just because the, they're comfortable enough for now, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and the discomfort that led to the second wave in the first place just hasn't heated up, you yes. know. A new discomfort has not, yes. you know, lit a fire. Well, uh, and, and I go back to um, the reason I got involved in this in the first place, which is that um, when the college that I worked for we ended up, this group of women, settling out of court. And the reason we settled out of court is because the two members of the Justice Department who came here to investigate the case basically said to us, um, our advice is that you figure out a way to settle this case because our office is being dismantled as we speak. This was after Ronald Reagan was elected president, mm -hmm. and that particular part of the Justice Department was being dismantled because who cares about discrimination in higher okay. education or any place else? And so we ended up doing an out of, you know, we did have an out of court settlement. And of course, then there were some provisions made that the college had to report so many years afterwards and so on. Well, those have long since passed. Mm -hmm. The point is, the college is now back doing some of the same stuff they did that caused us to file the suit in 1972, three in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is just more of the same. And I'm thinking that an awful lot of particularly young women, not to say that young men won't aren't aware of this and don't care. I think they really are, in many ways, more, um, their consciousness has been raised a great deal mm -hmm. from the men of my generation. But they, until you get into an employment situation, for example, mm -hmm. where you actually experience something that tells you that this is not right, then you know, that's going to be their their feminist clique, yeah. or whatever it is, yeah. uh, male or female, they'll find out um, what it's like to have been this. And I, I do think that you're right. You, you go along in life uh, very feeling sort of comfortable until such time that something happens that forces you to look at reality. Yeah. And I think that that was what happened yeah. to me. And it happened to a lot of those women. I mean, I'm thinking now about some of the women who were part of this group. And I'm thinking that there are some of those women that would never have called themselves feminists in, the, in any stretch of the imagination. But they knew that what was fair was fair or unfair was unfair. Mm -hmm. you know, and they were determined that they were going to write yeah. this and see it out to yeah. the end. Well, abstractions don't inspire. No, right. right. And real life. Crit real life inspires. And critical consciousness mm -hmm. does not happen mm -hmm. for humans mm -hmm. until they experience something right. that changes their perspective or they, they experience discrepancy in the claims a uh, culture makes about its values yes. and the way it behaves. Yes. So, you know, critical race theory and queer theory and, you know, these, these, right. we have learned a great deal from them for a good reason, mm -hmm. you know. Um, because the discomfort in many communities has been constant. Mm -hmm. It's just been part of real life all the time. Absolutely. Um, and that's, in a way, energizing mm -hmm. for a movement, for guarding your gains. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a real awareness that, you know, we have this much gain so far and we can't lose it. Yes. Um, the changes in... Uh, in the voting rights law that have recently been oh my God. handed down. I don't want to derail us on no, that, right. but, right. but you know, the, the reason that there was an instantaneous response to yeah. that is that there is a tradition in the African American community and in the civil rights movements yes. generally that Absolutely. just pays attention to these things. Absolutely. Because we know that they are vulnerable. Yeah. And and I, and I, I wish, wish you know, I, know, I was thrilled that a friend of mine had sent me an email yesterday basically saying, you know, happy uh, 
Civil Rights Day and da 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 da. And she sent it out to a bunch of people online.